Good morning, church. It is a joy to be back in the church. I called home for so many years. I was telling the guys this morning, the local church uh, I'm a member of, an elder at, the church at Odessa that we love, has zero natural light. So I'm so grateful for this room. I forgot how great uh, this room is. Hey, and I'm excited to be talking about one of my favorite subjects because in my experience, most Christians have spent more time thinking about a single week-long vacation than they had thought about the nature of the eternal kingdom of heaven. That's a problem for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, because when we fail to think deeply about our final destination, it leads us to settle for these wishy-washy half-truths about heaven that are peddled by culture, secular and church culture, by the way, rather than the whole truths that we see in Scripture, these half-truths, they're not full-blown lies, but they are incomplete enough to rob us of our purpose in the present and our hope for the future. Those are the stakes. So this morning, I just want to open up God's Word together and replace four of the most deeply pervasive half-truths about heaven with four whole truths. And by the end, my prayer is that we will all walk out of these doors with exponentially greater sense of purpose in our work, in our sports, in whatever it is you're doing at school students, and a whole lot more hope for our future with King Jesus. Are you with me, church? Say amen. Amen. Here's half-truth number one, this half-truth that earth is our temporary home. This maxim that is peddled hard by pastors and American idol winners alike I love you, Carrie Underwood. I really do. You just got this one wrong. Hey, let's start with what's true about this half-truth, okay? The moment a Christian experiences physical death, their body stays here on earth, and their spirit or soul returns to God. So it is true in a sense that you and I, when we die, quote, go on home to heaven. The lie is that we stay there. And unpacking some of Jesus' words... Most famous words, I would argue, would help us make this crystal clear. Look at John 14, 2. Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? But check this out, friends. The Greek word that we translate to rooms here is this Greek word called mone, which denotes temporary lodging. In other words, Guys, our mansions in the sky, whatever that means, I don't know where we got that. It certainly wasn't God's word, are not permanent residences. They're more like Airbnbs because ultimately it is not we who go to heaven, but heaven and the souls of the redeemed currently in God's dimension of heaven that come back to live in physical resurrected bodies. This is what all of 1 Corinthians 15 is about. And where are those physical resurrected bodies going to live forever? on a physical earth. Scripture makes this crystal clear. There's no debate amongst biblical scholars here. This is precisely what John's telling us in Revelation 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now here on earth, among his people, and he will dwell with them. Turns out, my mom's cassette tape of Belinda Carlisle was right after all. Ultimately, heaven is a place on earth. (laughs) According to God's good and perfect word, Nobody, including Jesus Christ, will spend eternity in heaven if what you mean by that word heaven is the present heaven where the souls of the redeemed currently are with God. God did not fit us for heaven to dwell with him there as we sing every single Christmas. He promised heaven on earth and to dwell with us here. Now, every time I talk about this, about half the audience is like, wait up a second, Jordan. Hold on. You're you're forgetting that that tricky little passage about how the earth is going to burn up at the end, right? Nod your heads if you're thinking this right now. I know half of you are. Don't lie. Hey, let's address the elephant in the room. This idea that this earth is going to burn up in the end is rooted in a very old 
I would argue, heretical interpretation of a single verse in God's word. It's 2 Peter 3.10. Here's the King James Version that your Sunday school teacher taught you 40 years ago. Here it is. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Sounds pretty clear that earth is our temporary home, right? The end is near. Not so fast, my friends. God bless Lee Corso. Good to see him back this year. Hey, Dr. N.T. Wright, whom Newsweek has called the world's leading New Testament scholar, is worth quoting at some length to un help us understand this passage. Bear with me through this long but helpful quote. Listen to Dr. Wright. He says, in 2 Peter 3.10, we have a statement which in older translations came out one way, but which, with all the biblical manuscripts we now have, almost certainly needs to be changed. And oh, by the way, it's why if you're reading anything other than KJV at home, you're reading the NIV, the New Living Translation, the ESV, the NASB, it doesn't say that the earth is going to be burned up. Because modern Bible translations have changed this. But in the older versions, Dr. Wright continues, this passage ends with the warning that the earth will be burned up. A cosmic destruction. The end of the physical world. Is that really what Peter wrote? Listen to this. If so, it is the only place in the whole of early Christian literature where such an idea is found. But in some manuscripts of the New Testament, including two of the very best, the word for will be burned up isn't there. Instead, there is a word which means will be found, will be discovered, or will be disclosed. You guys know how fire departments often manage controlled burns of the forest? That's the picture here. God is using fire to burn up the weeds and the thorns and the thistles of this earth, anything that is contrary to his will, so that the good stuff, the God-glorifying stuff, the neighbor-loving stuff will be found, will be discovered, and will be disclosed. Contrary to what the American end times industry might have you believe in your Facebook news feed, God's word does not say that God is going to use fire to vaporize the earth like Luke Skywalker vaporized the Death Star. <laughs> That's not what God's word says. If you're looking for a pop culture analogy to better understand this idea of a new earth, I think you could go do no better than Moana. Any Moana fans in the house? Come on, where are you at? You're my people. I heard boos. Don't you dare boo Moana. <laughs> Get off my lawn. No, 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 listen. Hey, if you haven't seen the movie, no worries. Here's what you need to know. One of the main characters in Moana is this beautiful personified island named Te Fiti, who is covered with lush green grass and these towering trees and the most beautifully colored flowers you can imagine. Probably a pretty good picture of what Eden looked like in Genesis 1 and 2 prior to the fall. But one day, Dwayne the Rock Johnson shows up and steals the heart of Te Fiti, and her beauty begins to crumble. Her once gorgeous exterior is covered with lava rock, and Te Fiti turns into a monstrous version of her former self. But the movie does not end with Te Fiti being destroyed. It ends with her being renewed. When Moana restores the heart of Te Fiti, the island's hardened exterior begins to break. And the original Te Fiti, beautiful, lush, and colorful, emerges from the ash. The contrast is so stark that this appears to be a net new, brand new island. But of course, it is not. It is the original Te Fiti, but better. Not a new island, but one once redeemed has been made like new. Raise your hand if you read my friend Dr. Randy Alcorn's phenomenal book on heaven that sold millions of copies. Dr. Alcorn told me that this is by far the best analogy he has ever seen of what scripture rather than culture says is God's plan for this earth. Believer, our hope is not for a whole new world, but for a whole renewed world, which, oh, by the way, makes perfect sense given the context of scripture. In the beginning, God looked around all that he had created those first six days 
the spiritual realm, you and I, spirit-filled beings, and the material world and called it very good. And friends, the sovereign God of the universe does not need a plan B. He has never once retracted his claim that this material world is good. Pastor Sky Jatani puts it this way, God's not a creator who rejects and replaces. He reconciles and redeems. And that's true of you and me. It's also true of this physical earth. Guys, it's only half true that earth is our temporary home. The whole truth is this. Earth is our temporary home until it is our perfect and permanent home once again. But hey, we have no idea how long that's going to be. That could be next year. It could be 1,000 years. It could be 10,000 years. Some of you are wondering, who cares? What in the world does this have to do with my life and my work today? I would submit that this has everything to do with the purpose that you face going back to school and work tomorrow. Let me break down the stakes of this as clearly as I can. Friends, if earth is indeed our temporary home and the present heaven is our permanent home, then matter doesn't matter. And the only thing you do with any eternal significance are the spiritual things you do, like studying God's word, praying, and sharing the gospel with your coworkers and your classmates. Because as this argument goes, souls are the only thing that God plans to save. Where's Jack, who I met this morning? It's right there. Jack. If earth is your temporary home, your AC business does not matter. Dave Connor, your architecture firm does not matter at all if earth is our temporary home. Students, playing your sports or your instrument doesn't matter. Sabrina, who's a realtor, homes don't matter unless, of course, you can leverage those things to the instrumental end of evangelism, to some instrumental and spiritual end. But they have zero intrinsic value to God, because it's all going to burn up. And friends, if that's true, then frankly, most of us are wasting the vast majority of our lives. Because I'm willing to bet you spend less than 1% of your waking hours walking the loss through the Romans Road. Guys, that math is deeply depressing. <laughs> but more importantly, guys, it's deeply unbiblical as we're starting to see, guys. And if this earth Here's the, here's the stakes on the whole truth side. If earth will one day be our perfect and permanent home, then matter must matter deeply to God. Because Jesus' blood paid to redeem my soul and the material world. And if that's true, then oh my word, my work with the spiritual and the material must matter. And if that's true, then 100% of your time in this life has the potential to contribute to God's eternal kingdom. Here's how one theologian who's way smarter than me put it. Here's Dr. Miroslav Volf. He says, the significance of secular things depends upon the value of creation. Do you see that? That's what we mean when we say secular. You're working with the material rather than the spiritual. The significance of secular things depends upon the value of creation, and the value of creation depends upon its final destiny and friends because we've just seen the final destiny of earth is redemption rather than destruction. You can be confident that your work with the material world, kicking a soccer ball made from the elements of the world, typing on an aluminum MacBook, selling and architecting homes must bring eternal pleasure. To God. All right, let's move on to half truth number two. This half truth that you and I are going back to Eden. That's essentially what the new earth is. In my experience, even people who understand the heaven is ultimately here still have really anemic views about what all that actually entails. And one of those views is that the new earth is a reset. We're going back to Genesis 1 and 2, which would make my best friend Clay very happy. You just want to live in the boonies out in rural. You'd be so happy if this were actually true. Wait, good news, Clay. There's a modicum of validity here. Let's check out Revelation 22. We see that everything sin broke in Eden in Genesis 3 has been renewed, and that the tree of life is once again at the center of the earth. But friends, the location of the tree of life is our first clue that this is way more than just Eden 2.0. Unlike the Eden we know from Genesis 1, this vision is of the Garden of Eden surrounded by a city 
the work of God's hands, which according to Revelation 21, stands 7 million feet tall, deep, and wide. John tells us that explicitly in Revelation 21. You got to convert stadia to, you know, modern measurement. But 7 million feet, does that blow your mind? Guys, if that's a price, you pay attention to this because this is going to knock your socks off. John goes on to say that it's not just the work of God's hands that are going to be present on the new earth. It's also some of the work of your hands and my hands as well. Look at Revelation 21, 25 to 26. After John describes the new Jerusalem, he says this. On no day will its, the city's gates, ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into the city. What in the world is John talking about? Thankfully, we don't have to wonder because Isaiah answered that question for us way back in the Old Testament. And even though these guys are writing some 800 years apart from each other, scholars agree that both men were, quote, working with the same material, end quote. They were working from the exact same prophetic visions. And so, Dr. Randy Alcorn says, Isaiah 60 serves as the best biblical commentary we have on Revelation 21 and 22. Hey, I don't know if you heard this. Uh, there's an election coming up in two weeks. Uh, you think we're going to be talking a little bit about Revelation 21 and 22? Yeah. You want to understand that passage? Read Isaiah 60, okay? And in that commentary, Isaiah says this. It's going to sound really familiar. Your gates will always stand open. He's talking about the New Jerusalem. So that people may bring you the wealth of the nations. This is nearly identical language to John. But unlike John, Isaiah goes on to list out what some of the glory and, the, and honor of the nations are. I think Isaiah was more of a detail guy than John. Listen to what Isaiah says. He says the glory of the nations includes incense, ships built by the nation of Tarshish, and refined silver and gold. Friends, make no mistake about it. These are all works of human hands. And both Isaiah and John are watching King Jesus welcome these cultural goods as acts of worship into the eternal New Jerusalem. The implication is startling. These prophetic visions suggest that some of the literal things you are working on tomorrow. I thought I, thought I saw Larry Giannone. Your, your auto repair shop the product you're building at work, the essay you're writing at school, the truck you're building, whatever it is, has the chance of literally and physically lasting into eternity. Does that blow your mind? Say amen. Come on. Guys, it's only half true that we're going back to Eden. The whole truth is that you and I are going back to Eden surrounded by the works of God's hands as well as some of our own. And why is it so important to understand this? Because this may sound trivial. It's like, I don't know, going down a deep rabbit trail of Bible trivia. I would suggest this is critically important. Because not only does this whole truth give us greater purpose in our sports and work tomorrow, not only should it give us greater hope for the future and freedom from the burden of a bucket list of thinking that this is my only chance to experience all the best things that this world has to offer, I would argue most importantly, this whole truth helps us appreciate the power and glory and majesty of Christ our King. All the more. Listen to Dr. Randy Alcorn. Some may think it's silly or sentimental to suppose that nature Animals, paintings, books, or a baseball bat might be resurrected and may appear to trivialize the coming resurrection, I would suggest that it does exactly the opposite. It elevates resurrection, emphasizing the power of Christ to radically renew mankind and far more, end quote. This morning, I'm going off script for a minute. Forgive me. This may not make any sense at all. This morning, we sung about the crown of thorns that Jesus wore on his head. Guys, because Christ wore that crown of thorns, we can be confident that the resurrection reversed all the thorns from Genesis 3 that, we, that were ushered in with the curse to truly make God's blessings flow far as the curse of, is found. The resurrected king is, yes, resurrecting me and you and 
He's resurrecting the material world and the work of our hands all to his greater glory and our greater joy. All right. We've just seen the heaven is ultimately on earth. We've seen it's way more than a return to Eden. But what on earth are we going to be doing on earth for billions and billions of years? I love how John Eldridge articulates this. He says, this is probably the one aspect of our future most shrouded in religious vapors, fogged in by a pea soup of vagueness, emptiness, and heavenly foam. Amen. Why? Because most Christians I know have settled for half-truth number three about heaven, that you and I are going to worship for all of eternity. Nobody articulated the fears associated with this half-truth better than Mark Twain and Huckleberry Finn. Listen to this. The widow Douglas told me she was going to live so as to go to the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. Well, I couldn't see no advantage in going where she was going, so I made up my mind I wouldn't try. Guys, I would have never admitted those words out loud to my pastor when I was a student here at Oakwood, but I quietly agreed with that sentiment for a very long time, probably up until my mid-20s. I remember vividly uh, sitting in chapel. Any, any Cambridge Christian parents or students in the room? There we go. I remember sitting in chapel um, a few times, listening to preachers talk about heaven, feeling horrified <laughs> at the idea of spending billions of years playing a harp. The prompt, yeah, yes, I wanted to be with Jesus more than anything. I, I even felt like this in my 20s, but it, it seemed to me that my desire to be with Jesus meant giving up all of the things on earth that I, and oh, by the way, Jesus himself loved on earth like good work like the mountains, like a good glass of wine. The idea of heaven wasn't a source of hope for me. It was a source of dread. And over the years, I have heard so many adults and kids admit those same fears and hush whispers laden with shame that I'm convinced that peddling this half-truth is one of Satan's all-time greatest hits. Guys, Satan doesn't need to convince you that heaven isn't real. He need only convince us that heaven is lame. Because if he can do that, he can convince us that this is our only chance to knock out that bucket list. He can steal our purpose in the present. He can steal our hope for the future. And he'll certainly steal our motivation to share our faith. Now, i got to make this crystal clear. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that we will worship God forever. That is the point of being drafted into the eternal kingdom of heaven. But the reason I call this a half-truth is that our understanding of that word worship is on our very best days. Half-truth. When we think of worship, we think almost exclusively of what we did prior to me coming up on stage. And listen, Scripture makes it clear we're going to do that. We are going to sing and worship God musically on the new earth but Scripture also makes it clear that God's definition of worship is way broader than strumming a harp and a lyre. Quick trip back to Genesis 2 makes this clear. Check this out. In Genesis 2.15, it says that God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And check this out, guys. The word we translate as work here is this Hebrew word abad, which is the exact same word we translate to mean worship elsewhere in Scripture. Guys, that means Adam and Eve were worshiping God not just when they walked with him in the cool of the morning, not just when they sang him, Lord, I lift your name on high, okay? They were worshiping God as they fully engaged in the first commission he gave you, and gave you and me in Genesis 1 and 2 to fill and subdue and rule the earth on his behalf. And in what may come as the greatest shock of this morning so far, the same will be true for you and me for all of eternity. Revelation 22 makes this clear. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will what? What does that say? Serve. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. 
They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God to give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. God's word does not say that we are going to sing, celebrate Jesus, celebrate, and Lord, I lift your name on high forever and ever. It does not say that we are going to recline in a hammock forever and ever. God's word says that you and I will reign and actively serve him free from the curse of sin forever and ever. And we don't have time to, to mine all the riches of what it means to reign, but I want to focus your attention on just one aspect of it. Part of what this means is that we will work joyfully forever and ever with the risen Christ. Again, the prophet Isaiah helps make this clear. Look at this, Isaiah 65, 17 through 23. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. My people will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. Oh my word, is that not good news for the poor? For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain. They and their descendants with them. Raise your hand if you love the work God has given you to do tomorrow morning. Students, raise your hand if you love the sport that God has called you to play or the instrument that you're practicing five days a week. Guys, this promise should fire you up. You should look like this kid. <laughs> this should massively fuel your hope. Because just as the paradise of Eden was a perfect vocation rather than a vacation, so it will be forevermore. Only now, for the first time in millennia, our work will be perfect and painless once again. There are no more bad bosses like my buddy Clay. He's a terrible boss. No more Clay Browns managing you. There's no more stress about exams. There's no more anxiety on Sunday nights about what awaits you on Monday morning because all of our working, all of our creating, all of our exploring will be free from the curse of sin. It'll be rigorous but rewarding. It'll be strenuous but sinless. All blissful worship to Christ our King. It's true in a sense that we will worship for eternity, but God's word says that this is the whole truth. We will worship God for eternity by singing yes and by filling, subduing, and ruling the new earth with King Jesus. But again, that could be way off in the future. So what? What does this mean for you and I right now? Here's what it means. Guys, if you will be working with Christ forever, then the work you do with him today through the power of the Holy Spirit is anything but temporal and secular. You're rehearsing something that is deeply eternal and sacred, and so you are free to joyfully and enthusiastically lean into that work, your sport, your instrument, whatever it is you do, as the good eternal gift from God that it is. One more half truth, and then we're going to land this plane. Half truth number four. Oh, I lost my slides. Here we go. Half truth number four. You and I are called to keep watch for Christ's return. Oh my gosh, we're going to hear this a lot over the next two weeks. Hey, <laughs> you and I live in the already and the not yet of the kingdom of God. On that first Easter Sunday, Jesus inaugurated the eternal kingdom of God, but we are still awaiting its consummation for Christ to return and permanently rip the thin veil currently separating God's dimension of heaven and our dimension of earth. What do we do while we wait? In a sense, we're called to keep watch for this per Christ's command. We see this explicitly in Matthew 25, 13. But the reason it's only half true we're called to keep watch is found in our interpretation of Christ's words here. Because the American end times machine has interpreted this to mean a very passive sort of keeping watch. Did you know they remade Left Behind, Quick Sidebar? I can't believe what you can get made these days. It's insane, right? The American end times machine has interpreted this as endlessly sitting on Facebook, speculating, 
about whether or not this is the day the Lord will return, which is really sad because, guys, this ain't even close to what Jesus was talking about. Immediately, the next verse, after Jesus called his disciples to keep watch, do you know what he launched into? You know what parable he launched into? The parable of the talents about a master who put his servants to work while they waited for his return. Guys, Jesus is putting the cookies on the bottom shelf for us here. He couldn't be any clearer. You and I are called to keep watch for Christ's return, not by sitting on our hands, but by working with them. It's true in a sense that we're called to keep watch for Christ's return. The whole truth is that you and I are called to keep watch for his return by giving ourselves fully to the work of the Lord until the day that we die. That doesn't mean you're doing work for pay until the day you die. Don't, don't misinterpret my words. But to, as Paul says, expend with all the energy we have in serving Christ our King. And guys, that means way more than simply sharing the gospel. Because as we've just seen, the kingdom of heaven has far more than saved souls. Yes, the Great Commission is a non-optional command for every single follower of Jesus. But, oh, by the way, Jesus spent 85% of his adult life engaged in the first commission. Are we telling God he made a mistake by doing that? I'm sure it's heck not. The work of the Lord is far broader than evangelism. So how can we state the work of the Lord more biblically and more broadly? I cannot answer that question more beautifully than my friend John Mark Comer has, so I won't. Listen to Pastor John Mark. He says, you, are called, you and I are called to a very specific kind of work, to make a garden-like world where image bearers can flourish and thrive, where people can experience and enjoy God's generous love, a kingdom where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven, where the glass wall between earth and heaven is so thin so clear and so translucent that you don't even remember it's there. In other words, guys, the good news of the gospel is not just that I get to go to heaven when I die. The good news of the gospel is that I get to partner with King Jesus in cultivating heaven on earth until I die. That's the good news of the gospel, that I've been drafted back into God's family to do this work alongside my risen king. At the beginning of this sermon, I promised that replacing these half-truths about heaven with whole truths would give you a lot more purpose in the present and hope in the future. Do you see the purpose? Do you see how much more purpose these whole truths assign to your life? Because when you walked in those doors this morning, I'm sure that you understood how at least 1% of your time on this earth matters for eternity. That 1% where you explicitly walk a friend at school or a friend at work through the Romans road. But here's what I hope you now see. Because this earth that you're working with is eternal. Because your vocation, unless you're a heart surgeon, is likely eternal. And because God may carry some of the literal work of your hands onto the new earth, you can be confident that 100% of your time at work tomorrow has the potential to last for eternity. The super spiritual stuff and the super earthly stuff like leading Zoom meetings and taking out the trash. I hope that gives you an unparalleled sense of hope, but a, a purpose. But I also pray that these whole truths give you an unparalleled sense of hope for our eternal future. We sang about this morning, a future where Christ gets greater glory because we don't just worship him as king of heaven. He is king of heaven and earth. And a future where you and I experience deeper joy as we worship Christ our King by singing and working alongside of Him forevermore. Lord willing, in two days, uh, I'm going to be publishing this little book right here called The Royal of You. Uh, those are my daughters, by the way. That's Kate on the left. She has new bangs. She's very proud of them. She wants you to know that they're brand new and she's not accepting feedback. She's very content with them. Uh, <laughs> That's Emery in the middle, and that's Ellison on the right. And I wrote this picture book to help my girls grasp these whole truths 20 or so years before I did. But I honestly wrote this book as much for you as I did for them. I wrote it as much for parents and grandparents 
as I did for kids. When I, when I started working with Random House, I told them that the book had to feel like an episode of Bluey. <laughs> All right? That makes 55-year-olds 50, weep and five-year-olds smile. So I want to close by reading you the royal in you. It's just this poetic, artistic summary of the whole truth about heaven that we just explored. Here it is. On a day coming soon, though nobody knows when, we'll look up at the sky and see heaven descend. Jesus said he won't stay in the clouds way up there. He'll bring heaven to earth and he'll live with us here. When heaven comes down, we'll all rush to meet Jesus, bringing paintings, inventions, and gifts for him with us. When we long at last reach our final destination, we'll hug long lost loved ones from every nation. Then we'll all turn and stare at God's epic new world and the city he made out of gold, gems, and pearls. As we step through the gates, we will all be in awe that a city can stand seven million feet tall. There will be no more sin, no more sickness or sadness, just the best things made perfect, bringing God and us gladness. The sun will stay set and the moon will be gone as God's radiant light blurs the dusk into dawn. But the best part by far is King Jesus will be there, making everything new with his peace, love, and care. And now you might think that our story is ending, but in fact, this is just the beginning because Jesus wants you to rule with him, to explore and fill the kingdom of heaven with him because kingdoms have more than just people and kings. They have art and bakeries, campfires and swings. God says he won't rule this world all on his own. He'll send princes and princesses out from his throne to ride without fear on the backs of great lions and blaze brand new trails through the middle of Zion to master the flute, piano, or timpani as Jesus applauds your brilliant symphony. Perhaps you will bulldoze roads for new cities or help lead the Jesus Welcome Committee or create a new sport with no need to worry about getting hurt or needing to hurry. You might spend time learning new subjects and skills with no fear of testing or loud fire drills. Maybe you'll explore galaxies far, far away and marvel at what God once made in a day. So don't think for one second that heaven is boring because we'll be reigning, creating, and exploring. Not just for our joy and surely not for our glory, but to love and to worship the one who is worthy. It'll be so much better than your wildest dreams ruling heaven on earth next to Jesus, our King. But hey, friends, here's what I hope you've started to see during this talk. We don't have to wait for the new Jerusalem to drop down from the sky to rule heaven on earth next to Jesus, our King. The kingdom is at hand, present tense, amen? Amen. In part now, in full soon, what are you and I supposed to do in the meantime? At school, on your sports team, in your office, work to make the glass wall between heaven and earth so clear and thin and translucent, you don't even remember it's there. Now, every time I read this quote, I told John Mark this a couple weeks ago, every time I read this quote, about half the room is looking at me like, that's beautiful, man. That's (laughs) incredible. While the other half of you, and I would be in this camp, wants to stand up and scream at me and ask, how? How in the world, in my business, in my school, do I make that wall between heaven and earth thin and clear and translucent? If I had another hour, that's what I would spend it on. But I don't. You guys are way tired of hearing from me, okay? (laughs) So I'm going to leave you with this. You don't have to give me your email address or anything, but if you scan that QR code right now, I want to send you, what you just heard is chapter two of a book I wrote called The Sacredness of Secular Work. This QR code gives you chapter five, which is where this gets uber, uber practical. I'm going to show you in this chapter 15 things we know 
mark our existence on the new earth. 15 core values of the kingdom, if you will, marks of the consummated kingdom. I'm then going to walk you through three practical ways you can reveal those marks of the kingdom tomorrow, along with case studies from everyone from C.S. Lewis to Joan of Arc and a call center employee and a bunch of other people. But I'm praying that those resources will help you in a really practical way bring heaven to earth tomorrow. Hey, join me in prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you first and foremost for the miracle of our salvation. The only thing we deserve is death through our sin. And you've given us Christ and so much more. God, we are not entitled to purpose. We are not entitled to a calling. But you have given us this eternal calling to work alongside you to implement the kingdom of heaven that Christ inaugurated at Easter. God, give us eyes to see how to do that in small ways and big. Give us time to do that. Free things up on our calendar so that we may be a blessing to those around us. God, and more than anything, God, I pray that as we do this work for you, we would never neglect to do it with you. Because God, you don't need us to do any of this work. Your purposes will not be thwarted. If we all die tomorrow, you could bring somebody else along to complete this work. God, you don't need us, but you want us. And so may our realization of that truth help us to abide in you as we work to bring heaven to earth tomorrow and every day. Amen.